The crew of STS-129 is an even mix of three previously flown astronauts and three first-time space travelers. Marine Colonel Charlie Hobaugh will be making his third space flight as he commands the STS-129 crew. On his last mission, Hobaugh flew as the pilot of STS-118. I've got a, a very uh, a strong crew, uh, five, five crew members on the core group, uh, and then of course we pick up Nicole to come home. Navy Captain Barry Wilmore will make his first journey into space as the pilot of Atlantis. Wilmore will be responsible for robotic operations with both the shuttle and station arms, and he will fly the orbiter as it undocks from station near the end of the mission. Former National Football League draft pick Leland Melvin will fly with the Atlantis crew as Mission Specialist 1. STS-129 is his second space flight. He first flew aboard STS-122 in 2008. Melvin will serve as this mission's robotics lead. Mission Specialist 2 is Marine Lieutenant Colonel Randy Bresnik. On STS-129, his first space flight, Bresnik will work outside ISS during two different spacewalks. Retired Navy Captain Mike Foreman, Mission Specialist 3, will be riding uphill a second time after first flying on STS-123. Foreman will exit the space station's hatch for two EVAs as the lead spacewalker. Dr. Bobby Satcher is Mission Specialist 4. Satcher will also work outside for two spacewalks during this his first space flight. A key objective during STS-129, the first of six remaining flights before the shuttle is retired, is to bring home current ISS flight engineer Nicole Stott. Stott has been a resident on station since Discovery docked in late August. Yeah, of course, we're. Uh ending the shuttle rotation crew member era, essentially. Uh, when we bring Nicole home, uh, we won't be bringing up uh, a replacement for her. So once we bring her home, all crew members uh, on station will be up and down on Soyuz. So that ends that, that rotation. As Atlantis reaches orbit and docks with ISS, NASA and its international partners are nearing the end of the construction phase of the space station. Most of the modules are there but we need to make sure we have enough parts and bolts, batteries, everything else that enables us to continue to operate on the space station. We are taking up these express logistics carriers, ELCs, two of them. They're upwards of almost 14,000 pounds apiece, and they are loaded with replaceable units on both sides. We call them the Waffle, Waffle 1 and Waffle 2. One of our main objectives is to get those attached to station so once the heavy lift capability of the shuttle goes away when it retires, We'll have up a lot of spare parts like um, uh, control moment gyros, pump pumps, nitrogen tanks, uh, ammonia tanks. Atlantis will also carry several mid-deck payloads. These include the Glacier Station Samples Refrigerator, the Mice Drawer System returning six rodents from station, the Spinal Elongation Experiment that measures the crew's seated height, and two Japanese experiments called Cerise and Rad Silk. The schedule for STS-129 features two days of robotics work and three spacewalks. On flight day three, the day after docking, the logistics carrier known as Waffle One takes center stage as the opening act for robotics operations. We're going to get our safety briefs on the station and then we are going to go ahead and install that first express logistics carrier, ELC-1, uh, before the end of that day and that's taking it out of the payload bay. Uh, with the shuttle arm, grabbing it with the uh, station arm and installing it. And that's, that's a full day. Each express logistics carrier measures about 20 feet by 20 feet. ELC-1 will be attached to the station's P3 truss on the nader side. This first logistics carrier is stocked with an ammonia tank assembly, a nitrogen tank assembly, a control moment gyro, a pump module, and a latching end effector for the station's robotic arm. During the first spacewalk on flight day four, Foreman and Satcher will step outside with Bresnik overseeing their timeline as the IV, intervehicular officer. 
Our first task is to take another spare part out of the space shuttle's payload bay, the SASA uh, payload, which is the S-band antenna support assembly. It's an antenna that, uh, that uh, failed on orbit. They brought it back, refurbished it, now it's ready to go, and, and we'll put it back into the spare location. Melvin and Wilmore will fly Satcher and the SASA on the station arm to the Z-1 truss. After helping Satcher transfer the spare SASA to its stowage location, Foreman will reroute wiring on Node 1, Unity, for Node 3, Tranquility, removing a safety slide wire and swapping out a handrail. Meanwhile, as preventive maintenance, Satcher will lubricate the end effectors of the station's arm and the Japanese arm. On flight day 6, Foreman and Bresnik will go outside the orbiting spacecraft for EVA-2. Station arm operators Melvin and Expedition 21 flight engineer Jeff Williams will man the robotic systems. They will work together to transfer the ELC-2 logistics carrier to the S-3 truss on the starboard zenith or top side of the station. Waffle 2 is stocked with an oxygen high pressure gas tank or HPGT a trailing umbilical system reel assembly for the station's rail car, a control moment gyro, a nitrogen tank assembly, a pump module, and the hardware needed to attach and expose two Missy 7 materials science experiment containers later on this mission. During this spacewalk, Foreman and Bresnik will relocate two antennas on the station's European module. One is uh, the AIS antenna, so they'll be going on the front side of Columbus, and the other one's a uh, 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 ham radio, essentially a ham radio antenna will go on the, uh, the bottom side out on the, on the starboard end of, of Columbus. After relocating the VISA video stanchion support assembly, Foreman and Bresnik will turn their attention to moving another antenna stanchion, the FPMU, floating potential measurement unit. The third and final EVA on flight day 8 features Satcher and Bresnik. They will install the oxygen HPGT, the high pressure gas tank, outside of the ISS airlock. Now, before we can install it there, there are some MMOD shields, which are micrometeorite debris shields um, that protect the space station from these strikes that we got to move out of the way. So we'll be detaching those, moving them out of the way, and we can install the gas tank. Melvin and Wilmore will grapple the spare HPGT from the ELC-2 with the station arm and will carefully transfer the oxygen tank to Satcher and Bresnik for installation on the airlock. The other uh, major activity is we'll be uh, deploying these material science experiments called MISSIES. Um, so we'll be getting those, and actually Randy will be getting those out of the cargo bay of the space shuttle and bringing those over to ELC-2 where they're installed and deployed. Um, and I'll also be doing some rerouting of some cables on Node 1 uh, for in anticipation of future install of, of Node 3. After Atlantis undocks and returns to Earth, workers across the country and around the world will continue preparations for the first shuttle flight of 2010. STS-130 will install Node 3 Tranquility and the cupola to the station. I think history will look very fondly upon the International Space Station as, you know, the greatest engineering marvel of its time. You don't look back at the pyramids or the Eiffel Tower or the Empire State Building. Nobody talks about their cost. Um, yes, um, you know, that's certainly a factor and that's important, but when you look back, it's, it's the, the, audi the audacity of the challenge that you accept to take on. As an end user, I get, you know, I get to sit up on the pointy end uh, when this thing blasts off. And, and, and goes up into orbit to the International Space Station. And to be honest with you, there's many of those people that work long, hard hours, that have more time invested than I have. So these people are passionate about their jobs, and I am grateful that they are. The flight itself is just a snapshot in time, and there's certainly things I, I, I'll always cherish and remember, but quite honestly, it's the uh, not only your crewmates and, and spouses, friends, families that are a direct part of, of your crew, but also the, uh, the, the flight directors, the flight control team, the people at Kennedy that support the flight, the, the tens of thousands of people that go into making a mission happen. So